Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak with you this afternoon. Um, and, you know, I think about sustainability and sustainable development these days. And uh, when I got into this field nearly 30 years ago, um, I feel like it was a nice to have. And more and more, it's feeling like it's essential, truly, just absolutely, truly essential as we move forward. So I'm very um, inspired by um, Cambridge Region Latin having this um, focus uh, on this issue. And Ethan, thank you again for the invitation to speak today. Um, so by way of introduction, as I was just saying to Ethan, um, uh, introducing who I am will give you a sense of some of the things that um, as a sustainability professional I deal with and, and the things I work on. Um, so I'm over at the Harvard Extension School, which is under what we call the Division of Continuing Education, which is under the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, which of course includes, uh, yes, the very famous Harvard College and the School for Engineering and Applied Sciences and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So as the program director, um, I'm involved with curriculum development, um, not only for sustainability, but a new area that we just introduced this last year called uh, global development practice. And so I pull from the various schools across the uh, university from the um, Harvard School of Public Health, the Graduate School of Education, uh, the medical school, the law school, etc. Um, and as well as um, several professionals in the area um, universities, as well as afar, um, and also practitioners. I mention this because it's truly a multidisciplinary field. And it truly does take a village to teach um, this um, material, this subject matter, um, from uh, the technical to the human health um, to the political and political economy. It really runs runs the gamut as part of that. And then likewise, um, the 300 or so admitted students I have uh, go on to do work um, that is, as I like to say, from Goldman Sachs to Greenpeace. And again, it's a truly multidisciplinary field. So you have people at, you know, the heavy duty finance of Goldman Sachs, all the way out to the NGOs of um, Greenpeace. We have people who are in the military. We have people who work for the United Nations and people who work for commercial companies. And they have a whole different slew of titles from being VPs of sustainability, all to be, uh, being artists, um, being senior managers, uh, external communicators. Um, again, it runs, it runs the gamut and the type of work um, that people do in this field. And so we have a couple of concentrations. One of those is uh, related to uh, business and business sustainability, so corporate sustainability and innovation. So that's basically our, if you will, commercial sector space where people in that space work on making better products, uh, thinking of new ways to uh, position businesses, um, taking existing businesses and making them better. Um, all with this gain around human health and the environment and also financial uh, sustainability as well. Um, we also have environmental policy and international development. So thinking about the various policies that would serve um, national governments, uh, local governments, and everywhere in between. Um, predominantly, um, our organization um, came from and involved from environmental management. So a lot of the policy that we work on is related to environment. Um, as we move forward. And likewise, natural resource management, which is not so much on the policy side, but implementation of a variety of different, if you will, projects, programs within institutions to relate to um, um, aspects of pres preservation and management of our natural resources. Um, and then in the built environment, we have sustainable cities. So moving into the denser areas of our communities and cities and all the issues related to them, think of cities as big areas of metabolism, air, water, land area, other resources that come in from not only regionally, but internationally that are consumed, that are discharged, all of the aspects about that, but of course the living environment for humans and what they need to do in terms of work as well as raising kids and families and living and enjoying uh, all the benefits of a, of a, a dense urban environment. Um, and then, more recently, we started a uh, focus on social justice. So this brings in political economy, issues of culture, issues of race, issues of gender, issues of fairness, um, and understanding how the various aspects of sustainability and sustainable development would relate to the, 
the human uh, domain. Um, and then um, this past year, we introduced an area around sustainable food systems. Food touches all of us. So looking at the variety of aspects around food and of course uh, from the, again, the aspects of human health and well-being to aspects of uh, land use, resource use, displacements of natural biomes, et cetera. All of those aspects of effects related to that. Um, food systems are going through a renaissance in the sense of it's not just about reducing impact. We're now going into levels of regenerative agriculture. So we, even, we have now courses around that. So it's not just, Hank, hey, can we stop depleting our soils? What can we do to actually regenerate our soils? Um, better carbon, higher productivity, uh, smaller footprints, all the things that would then help to benefit um, production of food, uh, meeting the goals of production of food, and um, looking at, as we talk about sustainable development goals, trying to alleviate hunger um, uh, globally. And then as I mentioned, we have this new program around uh, global development practice. And so that's a, if you will, a, a niche that's starting to um, arise. And that niche is um, not only understanding the natural sciences um, and um, how we're, we have an effect on our environment, but looking at, if you will, human health and well-being, and our social sciences, which is basically um, anthropology, history, um, economics, uh, to some extent, the technology that we use um, to uh, make things, um, and roll that all up around management. In other words, we are now at a point on practice that we need to educate the next generation of people on doing things. And, um, not only finding solutions, but actually implementing on uh, best strategies around those solutions. So this is a new program um, that is part of a um, global association of colleges and universities around the world. Um, similar to what you just saw, those four areas of paradigm. Um, it started at Columbia University under uh, Professor Sachs at the um, uh, uh, Earth Institute. Um, he is still involved, um, but there are now 38 colleges and universities that we are part of, PR, part of this uh, community, um, looking towards um, development, development that um, is really leveraging um, the things that we need to do to preserve human health and well-being. Um, one, uh, you know, shout out is the University of Winnipeg. It's really involved around indigenous peoples and understanding what works at the indigenous people's level of understanding what are best choices for human health and well-being. Um, Sciences Po in France deals more with uh, the developed economies. Terry University in New Delhi is, is very engaged as a developing or newly industrialized country, I should say, in India, is uh, very involved in um, human health and well-being for women, so reproductive health, um, aspects of job security, um, income uh, security um, and aspects in that part of the world where cultural aspects have um, unfortunately been, been a real um, uh, effect in terms of women's and women's rights. Um, we are also in this world of um, partnerships. We also work with MIT in their data economics and development policy organization under their department of economics, um, the now Newly minted Nobel laureate Esther Duflo runs this program. Um, so the, the um, uh, engagement and relationship that Harvard has with MIT, we're leveraging that. Uh, again, a big message around the multidisciplinary and aspects of this field um, continue to be a strength of the field. In this particular case, um, the Jamal Patrick, excuse me, Jamal Poverty Action Lab uh, works on. Um, evidence-based methodologies around development. So randomized control trial methodologies, uh, basically experimental design to look at which development uh, projects are better um, and more feasible under uh, particularly constraints of um, human capital and financial capital. Um, so it's a, it's a, if you will, the, the science-based end of the field of development that's uh, arising. And, they're moving forward with techniques of not only randomized control trials, but looking at aspects of artificial intelligence and machine learning to look at how you can even further optimize on a variety of different approaches. 
uh, to solving problems around sustainable development. Now, when I'm not doing my day job, I have another day job, and that's something called industrial ecology consultants. Um, this is where I got my start in the field. And um, one of the practitioners around what we call life cycle assessment or cradle to grave environmental and human health assessment. Um, so whether it be looking at paper versus plastic bags, introduction of electric vehicles, a variety of different policies around agriculture, it's a um, fully cradle to grave methodology that we really consider the largest picture. So we're not uh, trading one problem for another. It really comes from a very, if you will, position of best practices in understanding what are holistic solutions. And so with that field, and I like to be really transparent about this, uh, who I am and how I work. Um, yes, I work with um, companies like ExxonMobil, and I also work with companies like the Sustainable Consortium as well as the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. Uh, so from the very progressive, so to the very, if you will, institutional, um, some would say bad players. Um, I feel as a practitioner in the field, if um, there's anyone that's going to help them, who else but myself and others who are professionals in this field, uh, we rely a lot on fossil fuels, um, on the success of our economics now. We certainly need to move uh, away from them, decouple from carbon because of the very serious issues of climate change and the urgency associated with that. But the work, the hard work in this field is transitions. And that's going to be today's theme. Today's theme in sustainable development is how do we maintain sustainability in an ever-changing world? And so in that, that transition, that's the hard work. Not everyone's going to be in a benefit by transition. There are those people that are going to be left behind. Um, and we need to really think about how we can um, best move forward in benefiting as many people as we can, both in the short run as well as in the long run. So with that, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of things related to sustainability and sustainability science. Um, I'm honored to have a colleague here at Harvard University, um, Dr. Uh, William Clark, who's at the Kennedy School. Um, Dr. Clark is a seminal writer in the field of sustainability science. And um, uh, science here um, is a word that we define as knowledge. So it's not so much science as in hard sciences, but how we understand a field and, and the, if you will, the, to ta uh, the um, aspects of uh, uh, epistemological or knowledge around the uh, field itself is what we're developing and what we're working on. So things that are, are present to this in this new field of sustainability science is the connection between humans and nature. So the connection between nature and society. Right? That's what we emphasize. It's this interface. And yes, it is all about us in this paradigm. We think about what decisions are being made to benefit not only the individual, but societies as a whole. And so within that, there are wide discussions around uh, the natural sciences, because in many cases, we don't understand them. We understand very little about the natural sciences, and there's just a continual effort um, to do so. More recently, there's been a very strong push to build in what we understand about natural sciences and political economy. So the political agenda is so important. And in some regards, there, that I would have to say that um, many in my field have been very naive to the um, effects of politics and the um, aspects of getting things done. It is incredibly important that one understands political agendas writ large, um, not only from the local uh, to the uh, regional, but also at the national and international levels. Um, so this nature society interactions is, is a, a big part of, um, of what we're looking at, how we then nudge those interactions along to find our, our solutions and a continuous effort around education because the field is emerging. It's, it's um, ever changing, which makes it a very exciting field to be in um, at this point in time. Um, so in that evolution, these close coupling of the social ecological systems, we think about, you know, even in our own backyard here in, um, in the Boston area, 
some of us are old enough to remember that when we discharged our sewage, it went out on the uh, outgoing tide in the 1990s with very little treatment. And understanding the ecological aspects uh, of that choice and how we had to advance and clean up the harbor became very important. So Boston as a city on the ocean um, needs to understand that interaction, that boundary, and how we think about that boundary and the choices we make around that boundary, the boundaries that we have in terms of bringing fresh water. I know in Cambridge, water is brought in actually just outside of Route 128 and the Beltway, but for many other area communities, it comes all the way from the Quabbin Reservoir. So we are actually bringing water across several different watersheds into the urban core. We use that water and we discharge that fresh water, somewhat levels of treatment, but still xenobiotics, in other words, other pollutants that are part of that water system and are in interface to this natural environment that, it, that the Boston uh, urban area has um, thrived over the last uh, several centuries. So, so that understanding that interface is incredibly important. Um, as I mentioned, the transdisciplinary effects, you know, we're talking about the various aspects here at Harvard that we bring into it. Um, because there are, the problems are incredibly complex, um, complex in domains, complex in time, complex in space. Um, these are all the things that are, are part of bringing um, many disciplines together. And, and with that, there's a, a level of systems thinking, fancy way of saying that there are multiple disciplines that need to come together that are focused on issues. And so being focused on those issues is incredibly important. Having the persistence to understand more fully what those issues are, continue to iterate to find what are the true problems that we're trying to solve, and then better aligning those with um, solutions is ever part of, of this field. So that leads into um, a couple of things that I've worked on and, and uh, other examples. One is I, I've worked heavily with Levi Strauss and helping them to do cradle to grave environmental assessment of their 501 genes, the iconic product for them. Understanding where those impact, impacts are, particularly with cotton growing, as well as this, the part that we take part on, and that is caring for our products, caring for our apparel, um, how we wash them, how we dry them is actually as impactful as making the original product. But with that discovery and understanding what to optimize and what to improve, the message is that this world of sustainability is very complex. So an organization like Greenpeace, and I happened to be on the Levi's Plaza in San Francisco when this actually occurred, a protest by Greenpeace to say, hey Levi's, you're saying you're a good actor, but you're not good enough. You need to detoxify your products. You need to reduce the chemicals that are in your products. You can do better. You have to do better. Otherwise, we're going to just continue to let everyone know that you're not living up to what you're claiming. So in this very complex world of sustainability, and if you choose to go into this field in a variety of different areas, the challenges are great. The challenges are enormous. And, and, the, and the stakeholders are engaged. Uh, the stakeholders are coming at you in a very complex way to um, either make you do something or not do something. Um, and it brings full, um, full value to all the talents that we have, whether they be analytical skills, um, social skills, um, skills of patience and persistence, it brings them all together. Uh, more recently um, with Al Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the work that she has done as it relates to the Green New Deal is also an area of discovery and invention. In other words, we have this issue associated with climate change, an ever urgent increasing trajectory of impacts that are sitting in front of us. How do we solve that problem as well as what we're even seeing in the last couple of weeks uh, related to social justice? Bringing jobs and income equality to, to a fore um, and empowering people so that they will be more resilient in change. And so it's not just about solar panels, it's not just about uh, windmills and electric vehicles, it's about empowering people so that they can take on this change and we leverage that change. And so the invention here being um, this combination of the system, who's affected, how are they affected, who's going to be left behind as part of this and becomes incredibly important um, in our space of sustainable development. Um, 
couple of weeks, uh, years ago rather, uh, oh, I'm sorry, next example is around here in Boston by Boston University. Moving towards a carbon-free Boston. And carbon-free Boston, again, is looking at areas that are where uh, we need to be resilient. And so it's not just buildings to be resilient, we need people to be resilient. We need our neighborhoods to be resilient as communities. And this um, last uh, picture is not about the wonderful foliage, foliage in the Boston area that turns bright colors in the fall. It's about the communities that have the highest, if you will, contribution to greenhouse gas emissions on a per capita basis. And when we look at the inner core of where our city is, this is work done by UCAL Berkeley, we discover that those who are most, um, if you will, uh, vulnerable have been ones who are least contributing to the contributions to uh, climate change in, a, in even our own urban core. So again, discovery and invention, you know, discovery as to where is this problem coming from? What are some of the contributions to it? Understanding who and what is contributing and where it's happening. All these lead to um, better uh, solutions. Um, so key competencies. So as sustainability professionals and sustainability uh, development um, practitioners, um, competencies, um, this is work, um, oh, apologies, my, um, there we go, sorry. First and foremost is related to systems thinking. Get a fancy phrase, but let me bring more um, tangible words around that. System thinking is around aspects of how things interrelate with each other. What is the structure? How are they connected? What are the functions that they have? What are the feedbacks? In other words, is we um, uh, have an incentive for people to buy more electric vehicles, as an example. What does that lead to? Does that lead to feedbacks that we need a, a greater electricity grid and what that means in terms of the electricity grid and how clean it is? Um, complex behavioral aspects, in other words, as we um, seen over the last, oh, 48, three days, you know, we're seeing a movement, a social movement around um, defunding police uh, forces. And think about the feedback loops associated with that, the reinforcing feedback loops that are associated with that. That's a system. And feedback loops operate in two different ways, either reinforcing or the balancing. In other words, reinforcing, yes, in terms of the political uh, upheaval, the awareness on race issues, this is, a, this is a reinforcing feedback loop that we see and then, then it begins to change uh, public opinion. Um, balancing feedback loops, otherwise known as negative feedback loops, are not negative as a pejorative bad, they can also be very good. In other words, we might have a negative feedback loop in terms of reduction of emissions. And so that's what's so important around systems is understanding these feedback loops, where things are reinforcing both in a positive and negative standpoint. What are the tipping points, the points where we hit the inflection point and things progress rapidly, both in a good and, and bad way. Things that are resilient, in other words, to withstand um, a shock to the system, whether it be a storm, or um, trajectory in terms of what we're trying to do. We think about how, how resilient, how, how much a, a system will continue on the pathway we set it. And the ability to adapt, in other words, dynamic systems that allow us to think about how we move forward in an ever-changing climate, let's say. Um, it also means, of course, the domains, whether it be environment, social sciences, economy, technology, and understanding those domains. And in the end, it goes back to, yes, we as people, how we think about what our preferences are, the choices we make, um, how we perceive issues, what are our needs, what are our actions. These are all part of the system, the human system, the society that then is part of the generalized aspects of finding those solutions. So in addition to that, um, we need to anticipate. So sustainable development professionals, people in the field of sustainability need this aspect of time, obviously. Um, thinking of things, states in what's short run, what's long run. Concepts of uncertainty. So that wonderful 
math classes that you've had for statistics. Some of you probably had a little bit of statistics in your high school math. This is where it's really important to be able to understand and describe what is the probability of something happening because we work in worlds of incomplete information. We never know for certainty whether or not something's going to happen. And so we need to choose um, possibilities that are more likely than not um, or understand possibilities that are more likely than not. Uh, we need to think about, again, going back to our systems, what are some of the things you're going to uh, build inertia, dependencies, et cetera, um, to be able to anticipate what future development would lead us to. Um, other aspects to think about in terms of competencies, the normative competencies, these are things that we need to think about um, in terms of knowledge. What is the base of knowledge? Our environmental systems, what are our uh, legal systems, um, what are the principles that guide us, um, all the things that are around our structures of our systems that we think of, what are those principles, those guiding aspects that we define. Um, and then also in the, if you will, the human dimension, the ethical concepts that we understand, what, what, are, what are our, if you will, moral compasses that we have as a society, what guides us, what drives us as part of it and understanding what those things are. Um, we need to also think very strategically. So this goes into the um, aspects of um, planning, implementation, um, how do we basically be persistent and understand what will be our success factors? What are the things that we measuring? What are the things that we can't measure, but we would like to measure? What are the things that we uh, shouldn't be measuring. Um, in our program, we talk a lot about uh, gross domestic product, GDP, which is a measure of economic activity, and whether or not that is a true measure of sustainability. Economic activity can mean, yes, there's more being built, there's more being done, but it is the right things. Are we doing the things that we should be doing, and what are some of the limitations of those measurements? So strategic competencies are incredibly important in finding and working on those solutions. And lastly, um, this aspect of the human dimension, interpersonal competencies. You know, as, um, as high school students, you've gone through a rapid, if you will, part of your education is not just uh, the work that you do inside the classroom. It's the interpersonal skills and the knowledge and the concepts that you build as part of your community not only with your fellow students, but also with your teachers, the administration, with your community. These are incredibly important, incredibly important because we need to be relatable. We need to understand what others are thinking, what they are doing, what are the world views of others, and also to be able to reflect on our own world views and interact with others and be able to tell the stories that they can identify with, that they can relate to. Um, here in Boston, we have Joseph Ayun, who's the president of Northeastern. He came up with, a, he wrote a book a couple of years ago called Robot Proof. And, and the basis of this book is about, it's, it's for educators to think about uh, what do we need to think about as educators in terms of preparing students to be successful in their future lives um, in an ever, if you will, automated society. Um, but part of this, this book, and the reason why I mention it today, that's important um, as takeaways for you uh, the students um, is this aspects of of to be successful, and it relates to sustainability even as a in a general sense of you need literacy on what's the technology right now. In other words, how we solve aspects of say climate change. What are the what's what are the data sets that are out there? What's the inherent, if you will, pieces of information that we could use to look at technology, look at solution. But then human literacy, we need to understand again, as I just mentioned, that the human domain, interacting with others, we talk a little bit later around the sustainable development goals that are becoming a vernacular, being able to culturally relate, um, use language very precisely, and move forward is incredibly important. But also this then rolls up into a couple of, if you will, catchphrases um, that um, uh, Dr. Ayun, I think, very gracefully pulls together these concepts around critical thinking. You might have some of your teachers talk about that, critical thinking. Critical thinking is a way of, of um, asking the right question. 
making sure you are asking the right question. And the pursuit of making sure you're asking that right question will relate to experimentation and iterative approach, but in, if you what's almost truth finding and around um, the questions you, may, you should be asking. Sometimes the questions that we ask um, uh, may be superficial or may not be driven by a true essence of what is going on, but maybe from the information that we have. Um, you know, information say around um, uh, unemployment numbers, why are unemployment numbers high? Um, what's driving those? What can we do to solve unemployment? Well, there might be another question related to that, and that might be around economic viability, resilience for populations, because we have people not only who are unemployed, we have people who have dropped out and no longer are employable. And what are we going to do about them? So when we start to think about critical questions, we think about well, what is the issue that we're trying to solve? Um, and so systems thinking, as I just talked about, becomes part of this. Um, and entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is around seeing gaps and filling those gaps. It's not a fancy term around creating a new business, getting rich. It's around seeing where things that others don't see and solving that problem. That's being entrepreneurial. Um, and again, cultural agility, uh, Dr. Ayun uh, talks about as well. So then getting into um, our topic today, more directly, the sustainable development goals. And um, being this is the sustainable development, if you will, club at, at uh, Cambridge Union Latin, I, I probably don't need to introduce these at this very high level. There they are. At a level of uh, context from my own humble perspective is, it truly is setting the vernacular of the field. Wasn't expected, came out about five years ago. This delineation of the 17 sustainable development goals, they relate to, I'll uh, get into a little bit more history in a moment, but these areas of concern, these critical areas of things that we should be working on, it gives us, um, like I said, a vernacular to be more precise about the things that we're concerned about, from solving poverty and hunger, education, equity, et cetera, et cetera, right? But what this diagram does not show, this wonderful, colorful, iconic diagram does not show, is the importance of interconnections. So it does not, um, if you will, uh, meet our needs to look at clean water and sanitation, number six, I'm gonna solve that problem. It's more than that. It's more about what that represents, from clean water represents around good health and well-being, for example. Sanitation, similarly. It can also be related to education. Gee, how does it relate to education? Well, in developing countries, there's a whole host of young girls whose daily chore is to carry water. So if there's water infrastructure, then they don't have to spend as much time carrying water. They can spend more time on education. So issues of gender equality, issues of education, issues of health, issues of infrastructure, so sustainable cities and communities, uh, as well as number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. These are all part of that puzzle when we start to look at clean water and sanitation. Um, now, in this conversation of sustainable development goals, Johan Rockström at the Resilience uh, Institute um, talks about this aspect of planetary boundaries. And so this is really important in the sense of our, our, our planet is finite in the sense of a system. It does have some aspects of being an open system. But to understand truly what are some of the more urgent issues that are out there. Um, in this conversation, um, some of you may well know um, that it's not just climate change. We have some other very large issues that are actually even more urgent than climate change. Interrelated, one is biodiversity. We're seeing an enormous historical loss of the diversity of our species, mainly due to us and other aspects of climate change. And likewise, biochemical flows, particularly to agriculture. So nitrogen flows in um, agriculture are, if not the most important, one of the most important issues related to our planetary systems right now. And the flow of nitrogen um, that's not only um, 
uh, depletion of our soils, but also eutrophying our water bodies has an enormous impact uh, globally. Now, suffice to say, we also have aspects of climate change and other things where um, we've gotten a handle on like ozone depletion. And now we have emergent issues of uh, land system and land system changes as well. These are interrelated, but it's a conversation. It's a, it's a contextualization of the conversation of things that we should be um, uh, focused on in this field of sustainability. Um, as a, just as a level set, as you guys walk into the next stages of your lives, I know many of you are um, in this uh, club are juniors, maybe underclassmen, but think about the context of what we know and what we don't know. Uh, Wegener um, uh, basically had theories around continental drifts that led to tectonic plate understandings in the 1960s. We literally did not know how our planet operated on a physical sense until about 80 years ago to some level. Again, just to give us a sense of how much do we know and how much we don't know. Another example is the Malenkovich cycles, understanding essentially uh, the glacial cycles that happen every 150,000 years or so. Understanding that uh, Malenkovich cycles didn't happen until the 1940s. Understanding of those happened to now help us to understand well how our temperatures changing around the planet, what are some of the larger planetary forces. Again, 80 years ago, a fundamental thing we didn't understand about our planet um, until that time. Um, the guy hypothesis, Sir James Lovelock, was until the 1970s we really started to think about Earth as a system, a system in and of itself, and how we understand the interactions of that system. Um, and then we have more, um, both more recently, but also historically, the work of Darwin and understanding the evolution of species, but also tagline of that document or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. So that document was not only natural system but the human evolutionary aspects and a very charged conversation for a century around racial differences. And it wasn't until work done in the 1970s and then uh, more recently um, in the last couple of years and understanding what, what is race as a human being and how much physical difference do we have? Very little as it turns out. And in some regards, those of us who are Caucasian, white, black, etc., we have more variability among, among our own races than we do from race to race, which gives you somewhat a sense of how, if you will, um, uh, the serendipity of defi defining race. Um, many of the things that we just don't we're just beginning to really understand what that even means at the DNA level in terms of who we are and, and, and how we interact with our society and the, and, and the world at large. So it's this concept of, in the book uh, the, uh, of um, the Tangle Tree, we didn't understand until 1990s that there was actually a third branch of just human and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, living things in the globe from bacteria and eukaryotes, that being um, entities that have a nucleus in their cell, that's us, eukaryotes. And then there's this whole other group, archaea, another third branch. And so we're still even defining at a, a fundamental level our biological natural systems as well. Um, which leads to, as my uh, comment before around world societies, um, we're at this time in this field of sustainable development where we're, we're, we're taking the science, which is what we say, a positivism approach. In other words, we use the scientific method, we do experiments, uh, we understand what is true, what is false, we move on. The social sciences, a little more challenging to do so. So we're in the constructivism approach. In other words, we need to see the breadcrumbs, see the patterns, devise theories, understand them. And so we're in this world of post-positivism, a continuum of understanding the, um, if you will, quantitative information and the things that we don't fully understand entirely in the qualitative information and, and run that gamut. And being able to do, as we say, mixed method research analysis to understand the complexities of the systems that we're trying to understand and change as we move forward. 
And so with that, that's the, this aspect of sustainability. It's found in an ever-changing world. It reminds me of the uh, Italian um, uh, book um, around uh, the leopard, uh, Il Gattopardo, which is about from everything to stay the same, everything must change, right? So as we, we look to see, conserve, try to keep things, you know, the diversity of species, well, we have to understand that the, the world is changing in order to do that, in order to even preserve, keep things the same. It is an ever-changing world um, in order um, to face those challenges. So in this history of post-World War I and the League of Nations, which was basically rich countries trying to force, if you will, free market societies, didn't quite work so well. We had World War II. Apologies for such uh, distillation on incredibly complex subject, but in the advent of the United Nations and the restoration of peace, the restoration and re restoring of economic societies, uh, both in central parts, uh, centralized parts of where conflict happened, both in Europe and in Japan, we, we started to move forward picking up the pieces, putting things back together again, and really economic development was a, a, a big part of that. But with that incredible expansion, economic expansion through the 1950s, we started seeing, of course, at the Rachel Carson aspects in the early 1960s, where there's a limit. There's a limit to the things that we can do. Our planet can't take everything. So, so the modeling that started to occur the predictive aspects that started to occur around the limits to growth um, by Daniela Meadows at Dartmouth, who's no longer with us. This uh, seminal book around thinking about, and this is 1969, right? 1969, we had a good idea that things weren't going in the right direction and we had time to fix this. And so we progressed, but it's that point where we were really thinking about what was to the future and as early as 1969, the predictions of of contributions to climate change were spot on, okay? 50 years ago, 51 years ago, spot on, almost to the PPM. I mean, it's just amazing how much we knew um, and likewise how little uh, we've been able to accomplish in that period. As we reach over, over 415 PPM in all the issues that, that are part of that. And so, sustainable development goals. This is a way of taking control on this. Um, in the 1980s, late 1980s, we had um, what is the penultimate definition on sustainability, this aspect of, and this is from Wikipedia, right? Uh, from, the, from essentially the uh, publication, Our Common Future, by Bro Brundtland, uh, the Norwegian prime minister. Um, sustainable development is the kind of development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability for future generations to meet their own needs, right? And um, yes, as high school students are going to point, you know, that's one source, Wikipedia, but really what we need to do, of course, is go to the source, the actual publication, the Brontland Report, um, development that meets the needs of the present, yada, yada, you get it. But even still, there's another, there's another dig deep on this that's so important. Um, you go to chapter verse of this particular publication because that's the upper uh, well-quoted phrase of this um, goal around sustainability. You go into section three, page 27 of this document, you, you see a couple of words were left out. And the words are, humanity has the ability, which really speaks to hope, really speaks to we have the power, we are empowered to change the world. And that's what's so important about this document, that it's not too late, that human society has the strength, the capabilities, it is within us to do something. And so with that, those of us in this field, um, been lucky enough to meet John Ehrenfeld, who was at MIT for a number of years, um, he's now retired and writes quite prolifically around the sustainability field. Hint, Ethan might be someone to think about getting as a speaker. He's, a, he's amazing. Where it's not around sacrifice. It's about flourishing, right? Sustainability is not about being invited to the pity party. 
It is about celebration. So we have to get to that point. It behooves us to not settle. It behooves us to go beyond. Because that's so important. Because if we are going to bring people along, we have to talk about doing better. And that's what uh, Dr. Ehrenfeld so eloquently um, articulated in his book around sustainability by design. So with that, um, we have Agenda 21, 1990s, talking about the various aspects around what it is we need to do, uh, uh, what are the aspects of um, this 21st century, hence the name Agenda 21, um, that are going to solve the problems around socioeconomic issues, environmental issues, looking at the major groups that are to help us and how we're gonna implement this, right? So this is the beginning of the sustainable development goals. Um, and our outlook, our outlook is we can do this. We can slow things down. The world looks like a place that we're gonna be able to make progress. Hence the age of sustainable development is coined by Jeff Sachs um, in his book in 19, excuse me, 2013. Um, and looking at sustainable development in this paradigm of change. So the preservation of quality of life in a continuous play between change and stability. So things that we wanna preserve, but things that are gonna be changing uh, in many dimensions. Um, we have the Millennium Development Goals, so post the 1990s, um, starting in the year 2000, these eight different areas that were related to primarily the developing countries. So eradicating uh, extreme poverty and hunger, education, empowerment of by gender, reducing child mortality, maternal and reproductive health, AIDS epidemic, pandemic, malaria, other issues that those were suffering from, those in harm's way, try to reduce that. Looking at an ever-changing planet, trying to reduce the harm to that. And uh, partnerships, we gotta work together. Eight millennium development goals. They were seen as fairly successful. Um, many lives saved, um, particularly in the um, middle income countries um, here um, are uh, industrialized countries that are moving forward, but still there's much work to be done. Um, low income countries still at um, solving only 20% of the problems related to sanitation, uh, maternal mortality um, in the 40 to 50% child mortality. We went from, from 30,000 children a day dying to 15,000 a day dying. So many problems we still face, right? When you put the real numbers in front of it. So here we are, here we are, sustainable development goals. An effort, as I was saying, you know, to, to define many of these issues. Um, I'm sure the astute in, in, in my audience has noticed I've got 101 slides at the very bottom there. The rest of the slide deck has the rest of the sustainable development goals in detail. I will not be going over those. But I just put it in the slide deck as I give it to you, Ethan. Um, so, so one thing I'm gonna point out that's really important for you to understand is number one. Number one, no poverty. Why, why is this rhetorical question coming? Why is number one poverty? And when one digs deeper into the definition of what is poverty, one then reveals, well, what is this all about? The poverty is our greatest challenge. It is truly our greatest challenge, we as a human society in our agenda 2030, which is that essentially, as we talk about the sustainable development goals, this is the action to hit the aspirational 169 targets as part of the sustainable development goals. But this one on poverty is about denial of choices. So when we give people opportunity, this begins to unlock this aspect of doing better. So it's not about enough money to buy food, it's not enough about money to buy a house, a rent an apartment, etc. It is about opportunity. It is also about um, being able to effectively engage in society. Um, and yes, these 
aspects of meeting needs, as I mentioned. But it's also about living one life in fear versus not in fear, as we're seeing happening this last couple of weeks. Not being able to call the police because you're not sure if they're going to literally kill you. That's poverty. Violence, susceptibility to violence. So it's this broader term that's a foundational element of the sustainable development goals that's so important to understand. Um, so it's not just about climate change. It really is about the human condition. Um, the field's been developing very rapidly as we look at the variety of different 17 from people, planet, prosperity. Um, but one of the things that's arising is if we keep doing the things that we're doing, but do them less, that's not going to get us there. We really have to do things differently. This is a, a well-known, uh, uh, if you will, concept of um, human impact on the environment, where there's a number of people, the number of resources we use per person, the environmental impact of the things we do. Now it's loosely connected, it's not a precise equation, it's conceptual, but it basically says, if we're gonna rise our population from around almost 7.8 billion right now, up to 11 billion over the century or, or so, uh, say by 2050 up to 1.6 factor, where our resources using, each per person is going to go a factor three or five, that means our technology, the what we do and how we do it, it needs to be reduced a multiplicative of that number. So we're looking at, we got to do better than three to five, eight times what we're doing right now on a per person basis to really just keep things the same. So modernity, you know, the modern society, global society needs to change. And the sustainable development goals really don't talk about that. You know, it's, it's, it's about these aspirational goals, but it's not really talking a, a true global fundamental shift. So that's my criticism today, you know, as a educator, you know, you know, thinking critically about this. We're gonna have to be really careful, particularly as we come out of this pandemic, this global pandemic that we don't whipsaw right back to where we were and more so to basically get people working, get things going, doubling down on what we're doing. That's going to be a critical thing that we don't do. We have to change. And so what we're looking at now is techniques of um, the levers of governance, economy, individual collective action, and science and technology to look at these key points of change and transformation. So this is where even just this is, those in us in this field were, were digesting what the sustainable development goals and what they mean and how we're going to act on them from human health and well-being, uh, in solving economic inequities, uh, food system security, how we decarbonize energy systems, urban development that's effective, and then global environmental commons, how we use our oceans, our land, et cetera, the resources, our air, our water, and how we are going to manage those. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of work on, on interactive effects. It's a very interesting work in uh, University of Bern uh, in terms of you actually click through each one of those little circles and you can see each one of the interactive effects of the sustainable development goals. URL links at the bottom of my slides, again, you'll be receiving those. You can check that out. Um, and then there's the SDG knowledge platform. Again, as this field grows, people are working on a variety of different levels, understanding um, what are some of the things that are um, uh, at the national level. So you can look at each one of the countries, what are efforts going on, uh, drilling down to, um, again, this is the link SDG. You can actually look at various aspects of um, the SDGs themselves as it relates to a particular national environment, uh, economy, I should say. Uh, as an example, uh, understanding uh, infectious diseases here in India, looking at malaria, what is the aspects of the relationship between forests and pesticides and health policy and drilling down to each one of those. So there's an enormous amount of information that's starting to come out, um, again, by extracting at regional levels um, and what needs to be done and how it can be done. Um, and here, more of the kind of data that you, the type of data that you can receive from uh, this linked SDG as an example to explore the SDGs. 
And then likewise, um, a bit of surprise to the people in the development field, the commercial sector, the people that make stuff, have actually taken this on. And um, the UN Global Compact is the organization that, that where the uh, commercial sector shows up to discuss what are best practices, how do we do this? This is where the jobs are gonna be. The majority of the jobs related to this field are gonna be working in the commercial sector. Again, because they have the resources, both financially and human capital. Um, so this initiative on the Global Compact is to look at how the SDGs are related to businesses and moving forward. It's a wonderful resource and community of people that are looking at action. Um, uh, what can companies do? What can individuals do um, at the local level, at the international level, and everywhere in between? Um, and things that you can start to think about as they relate to the sustainable development goals um, and the interaction between actual action um, in society. So, yeah, Ethan, I guess I went a little bit longer, a little bit longer than I thought I was gonna go, but that's my SDG pitch. It um, looks like you have a question in the chat. Yeah, let me read it through. Am I seeing a shift in the mindset, that, that particular, uh, that question? Um, yeah. Yes and no. Yes and no. I'll start with a no first, uh, ending with the, the, the positive. No, these problems are daunting. And the problems are accelerating. And the older you get, the harder it is to, I guess, to almost feel like you're keeping up with many of these things. And then some level of being catatonic, some level of just, you know, fatalist. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that in the last... Oh, in the last year, we'll see publications like um, in the New Yorker or in the New York Times, to give you examples. Um, uh, uh, James Wallace um, and his Uninhabitable Earth book, which is just unbelievable in terms of what it's predicting. Um, it's incredibly challenging um, as part of that. Um, so yeah, seeing, seeing this fatalism growing and um, you know, this, this aspect of how much of a, a, of a level of crisis are we currently in? And um, I think that goes both ways. One is if it's not perceived as a crisis or other things more present to people, that they need to get uh, a job, pay the rent, et cetera, they're gonna be solving those problems versus thinking about decoupling the carbon of um, their cars or whatever, you know, their choices. These longer term choices aren't gonna happen. Um, but on the other side is, uh, uh, if it is a crisis, is perceived as a crisis, then people do act. So in that element, I think, and I think that there really is a disparity by generation. Those of us, to say, I guess, speak more frankly about it, those of us have a little bit more runway in front of our lives versus behind us, seem to be getting it. The seriousness of the crisis, seriousness of what it means to decouple sooner than later in terms of carbon the need to find avenues of political economy for social justice sooner than later. Because unless we empower people, they're not going to be able to be resilient as part of this. So I am inspired. I am inspired by the many people that, like Ethan, who's been my student, and the many students I have in my, my classes, who are ready and, um, who are not, if you will, beaten down, who are inspired, um, have the energy and have the uh, wherewithal to um, find uh, the solutions, work together, find the uh, like-minded individuals to move forward. And, um, and so I think we are at a, at a, at a point where, um, as we've seen in terms of um, issues related to gender identity, uh, shift very quickly not generationally, but in a societal sense of social understanding, um, that that's hard. that gives me hope as well, that the concepts that, and priorities are at a level of uh, the human dimension to, to think around what's important. And so the ability to change priorities will come when people believe they are important and that can happen very quickly. Uh, but it is, we are facing some enormous challenges.
without question. Um, I, there was a question that somebody asked because they don't, their mic isn't working. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the students was asking what we as a CRLS club of high schoolers can do to make a crucial and important impact beyond just educating themselves and their peers. I'll take the word education and, 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 um, and expand it. Uh, around um, the skill sets. Actually, I'm getting a message of low quality audio. Can you guys still hear me okay? It was a bit uh, it, cracked up a some, few seconds ago. Yeah, oh. there, it, it's good now though. Okay, very good. Um, so it's not just being, being able to understand the issues, right? What you're going to need to do as individuals um, to understand how you can be a agent of change. Agent of change, both yes, locally, at a larger community level, and then uh, your audio is going. On uh, it's going for fr Fritzy, huh? Mm. It's getting to the afternoon. Uh, that's getting tired. One second. Okay, it seems to have settled. Are we good. Yes. He was freaking out a little bit earlier this afternoon. I was like, oh no. So many people at home, so many people zooming. Anyway, I was like, roll back the reel. Here we go. So, this aspect of education as a whole self is really important. And so, what I mean by that is, you know, many of the skill sets that I just was talking about in terms of systems thinking and anticipatory and, um, yes, the knowledge. Uh, the normative sciences, um, but in this aspect of um, interacting with others. So think about yourself as um, uh, this uh, holistic um, being and what you're doing is incredibly important. Um, you know, what you can do for your own resiliency, what you can do to help others to be resilient. Um, and then also the capacity to be reflective and understand multiple world views. Um, it's not just your worldview and what, how you see the world, it's how others see the world and understanding what is there um, for them. Because until you, until you understand where other people are coming from, that huge ability of empathy, um, you won't be able to help them understand the way you see the world too. Um, so I think that that's incredibly important on each one of us to really rise to the occasion that we've got a, a, beer, a, a better form of ourselves, a, a better form of our complete selves as we move forward. Um, that will then lead to the many things that we're talking about in terms of what, what are the actions that you can take locally, um, working with um, uh, political groups, the job you do, whether it be directly related or indirectly related, you, you bring that, you bring that to the table. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's incredibly important as you engage uh, beyond um, your world in Cambridge and elsewhere um, as part of that. I really, really truly believe that and try to inspire that in others. You know, even just the slide that I have here as an example, for us to move forward, um, there's the 17 sustainable development goals that have had, um, oh, hours and hours of people hashing them out at the UN level, the high level political forum of the UN, which is an incredibly messy process. Well, they're not the end all be all. They're certainly a great start, certainly a great place to see the world, but we always have to think about them as just like any paradigm, we need to own it, we need to challenge it, we need to think beyond it. What are some of the things that need to be improved? What are some of the things that are wonderful and we should keep? I mentioned this aspect of modernity, that aspect of overlay sustainable development goals on a, on a, uh, a technological economic system that is going in the wrong direction and we may just get development that continues and accelerates in the wrong direction. 
and we really truly need to to think about whether or not it's it is fixing root causes of the problem. Um, so that's a big part of you know how we engage um, in these issues. Yeah. So I have a question. Uh, what do you think, in what ways do you think the media can help uh, change this, uh, the attitude that people have of uh, like uh, pushing this off till later, pushing action off till later? How do you think the media could help fix that? That's a great question, Ethan. I think we're all struggling with the media, right? We're all struggling with the media in a variety of different levels. Finding out what's true, finding out what's counter opinions, being able to see those opinions in the light of the context that they are. Um, the contextual aspects of the media, it's as though we're going through uh, the late 19th century and the proliferation of newspapers and yellow journalism. Um, journalism that was unbarred, right? Not even journalism. Words and papers that were not edit didn't have any editors associated with them. And now we're in the wild west of social media, electronic social media, that accelerates the the news cycle. It accelerates um, many of the things that um, are used to deliberately obfuscate um, the important issues. But likewise, the ability to bring other issues to light, such as um, our smartphones that record actual violence that then get posted to social media and we see it. We see it almost immediately. Um, and so we, we can't rely on the media only. That's what I'm thinking on your question is that we need to educate ourselves on how best to use this incredibly powerful tool. And, and figure that out. And I not to say that we give them those that are owners and powerful in terms of the media a free ride, but we're gonna have to help them be better at what they're doing. Be better in terms of how the, they need to be essentially responsible or take greater responsibility for what they're doing. But at the same balance, being able to also um, bring issues to light um, that wouldn't normally see otherwise. Um, you know, again, the issues on climate change, I'm sure many of you have uh, witnessed is we have, if you will, a disparity of power in terms of the counter view, right? We have 99.9% .9 of the people agree with climate change. Oh, but we need the opposing views. That opposing view is held at the same level as the wealth of information that's related to climate change and the severity of it. So the asymmetry of the power is what we're seeing as some of the root causes. And the solutions to that asymmetry are, again, checks and balances, um, but also a level of freedom of that. But again, how we then need to educate ourselves as uh, better skilled in understanding contextually what that information means. Yeah, excellent question, Ethan, and still unsolved in this incredible changing environment of uh, uh, media. You know, um, I think about, and I, I apologize for uh, maybe the irreverence of this example, uh, but there's a comedian, Sarah Cooper, who on TikTok um, didn't change the words of our president, basically facial expressions over the narrative of the president's voice. And that, that is, it was incredibly powerful, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, incredibly powerful. So here's this thing, this technology, TikTok, that's, you know, people mouthing words to songs that then turns into this other aspect of satire on the political economy that then becomes this incredibly powerful message around a black woman's perception on if, she, and this is her words, if she were to say those things, she would be ridiculed and how she was empowering herself 
to show the light of day of these words that were being said in a public domain. And I just use that as an example, the reflection of that example is, um, you know, that the, the, again, the power of these tools, it's like the unintended good consequences and potentially bad consequences of them. And we are still learning those powers. But um, yeah, excellent, excellent question, Ethan. So is this what everyone thought sustainable development? I know you guys have been, hey, as, a, as the presenter, maybe I'll ask a question out. What is my talk giving you in terms of perspective on sustainable development and the sustainable development goals? Does it make you think, oh yeah, that's about right. Or, or it's a little bit different, not what you thought. I think for me at least, it just kind of cemented how much how many different forms sustainable development can take and how much thought is put into each side of them. Yeah. So the depth, right? The depth of this, which, um, you know, leads again to that, it takes a village, right? It, the pluralistic aspect of this is incredibly important. Um, so it's not just my voice, my Harvard University program, uh, that will win the day. It's the multitudes of different programs, such as the program I mentioned at Winnipeg, uh, the voices of indigenous peoples, what knowledge and skills that they can bring, um, and the important messages that they have, um, and um, livelihoods that they had that were sustainable far before these 17 sustainable development goals were defined. All right, so is that it? Is, uh, are there any more questions or anything? Good over here. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much, Professor Gloria, for coming today to speak. Uh, it was great and uh, a lot more in depth than I was expecting. Thanks. Thank you. Well, hopefully, yes, you'll uh, you have some messages to take away, and I I hopefully I didn't go on a little bit too academic, but uh, no, it's fine. Uh, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, well, I again thank all of you for taking the time to uh, listen to me uh, this afternoon. Um, I wish you all the best in these incredibly challenging times. Um, they are ruthless. We could be diligent, and then that one thing we don't do right can get get us um, so we all have to be continually diligent as I said uh, as we move forward so uh, Ethan it's been a pleasure thank you for your persistence in getting me to talk and uh, I, again everyone have a great rest of the summer and as uh, the Cambridge school system hopefully will open up at some point who knows when uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's a trip for sure. Thank you very much. It was really very interesting. All thank right. you. All right, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>